I'm actually going to uh, get going with this this uh, this session today. So uh, my name is Sharon Peacock. Uh, I'm the director of uh, COG UK, and I'm really really delighted to be uh, chairing this event, this Women in COG event today. So it's absolutely fantastic that we've got Andrew Douglas MBE to talk to, with us today. And so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about, about Angela and, and what she does and what she's done in the past. So Angela is currently the Deputy Chief uh, Scientific Officer for NHS England and NHS Improvement. She's worked in the NHS and in particular in genetics for almost 40 years and is a Fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists and an Honorary Fellow of the Academy for Healthcare Science. Andrea is currently working very closely with NHS Test and Trace in new product uh, technical validation and is supporting labs in COVID-19 testing through quality assurance. She also supports the National Clinical Engineers Network in the COVID-19 pandemic endeavour. Now, Angela has been very highly recognised by numerous awards, I'll go over some of them. Um, so in 2014, Angela was named the health service named in the Health Service Journal as one of the UK's top 50 inspirational women leaders and NHS Coach of the Year by NHS Leadership Academy in, in the same year, 2014. So the following year in 2015, Angela was awarded the Healthcare Scientist of the Year by NHS England. And in 2016, she was honored in the Queen's 90th birthday honors list as a, a member of the Order of the British Empire for her contribution to research and mentoring students. And in May uh, 2021, Angela was made Honorary Fellow of the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine. You can simply tell from that, uh, that list of, of awards, and I'm sure that's not all of them, uh, that this is going to be a really interesting session today to hear about Angela and her life and her career. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to getting started. I'd like to give us a, a special thank you because it's Angela's birthday tomorrow. Um, uh, fortunately, we didn't ask you to speak uh, on your birthday, but a very happy birthday to you, Angela, for, for tomorrow. So on to some housekeeping issues uh, before we get started. So we're going to have a, a, a Q&A uh, and that's going to be between Angela and Catherine Ludden. So Dr. Ludden is the Director of Operations at COG UK. Uh, and then there's going to be the chance for you to ask any questions that you might have. I'd ask you to stay on mute unless you are asking uh, your question and then to introduce yourself. Now, the event is being recorded uh, and the recording is going to be available on the COG UK website and also on the COG UK YouTube channel. So if you uh, don't get to hear uh, 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 or you want to go back and hear it again, or if there's anybody you know that you think will be interested in hearing this themselves for the first time, do signpost it to them so that they can go and listen to it uh, through uh, the recording. So I've said probably more than enough, um, but again, welcome Angela and uh, thank you to Catherine and I'm going to hand over to you. I'm really looking forward to, to uh, uh, what, you're, what you're going to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, as Sharon introduced, I'm Dr. Catherine Ludden, and I'm very privileged to be interviewing Angela on our Women in COG event. And just a big thank you to Angela for joining our event today and agreeing to share your story, which will be very inspirational, I think, to everybody on the call. Um, as Sharon mentioned, we'll have just a, a really nice and formal chat between Angela and I um, till about 12.45, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, and so please do put your questions in the chat. Um, and then at, towards 12.45, we'll start taking some questions. We're also happy for people to raise their hands at that time period um, and ask, be able to ask Angela themselves. Um, so Angela, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get started. And I think no better way to start, but um, just to ask you a bit about, you know, what it was life like for you growing up and how did you get interested in, in science? Well, first of all, Catherine, thank you so much to all of you for inviting me. and. Um, um, if you've read my horoscope, you probably wouldn't have come today, but uh, I'm here and uh, yeah, because I like a challenge. Um, I was born in Camden Town and I don't know if people watch um, that uh, called The Midwife, but actually I was born at home and the midwives did come out um, on their cycles, according to my parents, um, and delivered me um, at home uh, in the house, which was actually um, 
of the thing to do in the 50s. You know, they didn't rush you into hospital to have your baby. So, so um, I was born at home. I'm, I was the middle child. I had an older brother who um, was always very good at maths and a very, very talented younger sister who's an art artist, a fantastically talented uh, younger sister. So I was sort of in the middle and not really very special growing up. So people didn't really notice me. My sister was the cute one and my brother was the intelligent one. And I just sort of, you know, kept silent in, in the background. I think if you asked my um, brother and sister about my growing up, they would have said I was a bookworm. Um, I loved to read. I really did. Um, I couldn't read enough when I was young. I think it was a little bit of escapism as well. You know, for, I started by reading all the sorts of stories that that young girls read. And then I picked up a book at the local library called Professor Brainstorm. And um, and he was this mad professor who used to invent things. And then I started to think, do you know what? I quite like to be a mad professor and invent things. Um, didn't quite make it to the mad professor bit, but uh, from the age of about 12, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I just didn't know what sort of science I wanted to get into. And it wasn't till I was doing my A-levels, um, we had a relief biology teacher because our biology teacher went on maternity leave and she was stunningly beautiful, really young, much, much younger than our substantive teacher. And she taught us genetics and she taught us uh, inheritance and she taught us about syndromes. And I mean, in particular, Down syndrome. And I had a god brother, my godfather's son was a Down syndrome. And it really helped me to understand and, and I really wanted to know more. And it was from then that I actually knew that I wanted to get into genetics. And it was that particular teacher, Miss Lockett, who helped me to complete my UCAS form. Um, she helped me to choose the course. I actually wanted to do genetics at UCL. It was the first time they were going to be running a sort of full genetics course. And, and I decided that, you know, that that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to do uh, genetics. And, um, and I was fortunate enough to, to, to get in. Um, and it was a, a great course, really inspirational. I had, you know, the, the people that sort of taught me became, you know, as my career progressed, they became greats in their own career. I mean, Joy Delhanty um, was, was, was one of my supervisors. She taught me human cytogenetics, which I absolutely loved. And, um, you know, Stephen Jones, Professor Stephen Jones taught me about genetic diversity and he was my supervisor in third year and again, you know, it really inspirational um, teachers to have, lecturers to have at university and, and, and supervisors, and, and always encouraged us, you know, to, to uh, you know, continue to stay in genetics. And it was actually um, Stephen Jones who got me my first job at London Zoo. That's another story. <laughs> Do you want to continue? Yeah, I, th I think just to say, Angela, I think you, you know, touched on some really important points there about, you know, the importance of really nurturing science, you know, at a young age, but through the importance of the role model of teachers and, you know, helping you really select, you know, how you choose your career. And I think that is really important. Many people on this call are already scientists, but to remember how important it is that we have that education and training and, you know, nurturing children, uh, women and men to kind of go into science. Um, and just before we go into the, the zoo story, because I'm quite intrigued by this, the zoo story and how that led on to more genetics, I just wanted to ask you, was there any obstacles that you felt? I know that at the time, gen genetics wasn't as, as popular as it was now, or there wasn't as many courses. Did you feel that you faced any particular obstacles at that time, or was it just, was it, you know, nurtured by purely by the, the teachers and the encouragement? Yeah. I mean, my parents were very, very supportive, really supportive of education generally. Um, you know, the, the fact that I wanted to, you know, continue with my education it was something that they really did support. So that was that was great, especially as a, you know, a, a young girl growing up in the, you know, 60s and 70s. Most most girls just wanted to to, you know, leave school as quickly as possible and, and get a job and get married. Um, and interestingly, my dad's brother lived with us at the time. And I think he was probably my biggest pushback because 
we constantly had this discussion about why as a girl I wanted to continue going to school, you know, when I really should be working to line my bridal drawer, you know. And, um, you know, we had these constant arguments about how important it was for girls to have an education, just as important um, for boys. And, and I used to, you know, I used to find that he really challenged me and I used to really worry that um, he would change my parents' minds. But but I think my, my mother was a real matriarch. My parents were, you know, both from Cyprus, came to England from a very, very young age. And, um, you know, my mother, having come, you know, to England when she was 15, um, was a really, really strong woman. And, um, you know, she wanted us to, to, to have good careers. She wanted us to, to, to get all the education that, that we could. So she absolutely supported me, which was fantastic. And we're all very delighted she did. And, you know, the, the amazing career that you've had, had to date. And I think that's where probably the best way to go on to our next discussion. So it'd be great to hear the story about the zoo and how you went on from after you started studying um, to genetics to what happened next? Okay, so my very first job was at uh, the Zoological Society at London Zoo, and I was uh, working for um, Dr. David Whitehouse, and our role was to map the chromosomes of all the animals in the zoo. You know, this was late 70s, early 80s, and we really didn't know what the chromosomes were of all the different animals. And we had many monomorphic species that looked the same, like birds, that males and females looked the same, as well as those that that, uh, that, that looked dif physically different. Um, so we started with the smaller uh, creatures, which was easy enough. But then we sort of progressed onto the bigger animals, and the bigger the animals got, the more I realized that I was actually scared of animals. And so the zoo was not the place to be. And um, I had, there were two encounters that absolutely nailed the fact that I really shouldn't have a career at London Zoo. And the first one was, um, I had to bleed a condor. Now condors are a very, very large bird. And, I rem and I'm, I'm five foot three and a half, I'm not tall. Um, and this condor was about the same size as I was standing on the ground. And, and although the keeper was there keeping this bird very calm, I was really nervous. In fact, I think I was petrified. I was a bit more than nervous. Um, and I think the bird sensed it and it tried to take a swipe at me. And I had the syringe and needle in one hand. And by the way, I had to have a home office license to bleed animals. At that time, you could bleed people without a license, but to bleed animals, you had to have a home office license. So I stood there with the syringe in one hand with the needle as this condor tried to take a swipe at me and I put my hand up and it got its claw caught in my ring. I had an engagement ring, I was in, in, engaged at the time. Got its claw caught in my engagement ring. And I remember just staring at this condor as it stared at me and I just kept thinking it had that face of an old man and it we were just sort of caught there while the keeper got out this clipper and I thought oh good he's going to clip its claw off so I can get away he clipped my ring and I was like horrified as my ring sort of fell to the ground and I was just like looking at him and he went you can live without your ring but that bird will not be able to eat without its claw and I just thought, you know, <laughs> hmm, okay. I did get my, I actually did get my ring fixed, but it's a lot thinner, you know, than, than because where it's been repaired. So that was the first encounter. Um, and I thought, do you know what? I am going to overcome this fear of animals. And the, the, well, there were other encounters, not as bad, but the one that particularly sort of put the nail in my coffin for leaving the zoo was I had a phone call from the vet saying that one of the lionesses had been brought in to have some work done on her teeth and she was sedated and it was a good time to come in and, and to take some blood from her. So I went over to the veterinary theatres and um, you know he was standing outside and he said oh you know she's in there and I walked in stupidly thinking sedated meant she was going to be fast asleep. But she wasn't. And as I walked in, she sort of looked up at me. And I don't 
really remember very much else except that I came round on another theatre bed in another theatre and the vet and vet saying to me do you know you really shouldn't be working at the zoo if you don't like animals and I just thought do you know what it's absolutely right I don't like animals I am I, no I like animals I'm just terrified of them so the zoo was not the place for me and um David Whitehouse helped me to, again, apply for a job that was going at Guy's Hospital for a human cytogeneticist. And uh, in all fairness, working with human beings is a lot easier, certainly for me. So, yeah, that nailed it for me. I think, you know, to work at London Zoo in science, animals had to come first. The science came second. And I think for me, you know, the science came first. So the zoo was not the place for me to be working so professor, so then I, I, professor brainstorm has a fear <laughs> which, absolutely. Which, to, which to be fair you know taking blood from a lioness is, is a pretty big thing to do so i think many people can fully acknowledge the the terror that that would that would involve so i don't think you'd be on your own in, in how you felt at that moment of time but it sort of i think the lesson that it taught me you know I, I then went on, you know, to to build a successful career in in human uh, genetics. But I think what it taught me is that, you know, you are never, it's never too late to change your mind and change direction. You know, you might have to start again, but um, you know, you you're, you still you soon you know get back up to 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 where you want to be. And and you know, I, it didn't take me very long, uh, guys. I did. Uh, the part one of, of uh, the uh, MRC path then of the Royal College of Pathologists and became a diplomat. Um, and, and whilst I was um, working at uh, Guy's, we evaluated an image analysis system. It was the first image analysis system that had been built for chromosomes. And we were evaluating it at the time uh, for what was the Department of Health then. And, um, and I remember this system it was almost it was like it's like a camera based on a computerized stage um linked to a computer and all the images of of the cells were sort of sent to a screen and you were able to do manipulate the images and analyze chromosomes um on a, on a screen and we were on the ninth floor of of guy's tower um the department that i work i worked in um and the screen constantly shook and it got to the point where it used to make me feel a little bit nauseous um, now this system had been developed by nasa to analyze the chromosomes of astronauts that came came back from space um, and uh, the the people who had developed it and the engineers were based in houston in texas and so we called in one of these engineers to to come and um, sort out this uh, system because it, it just we couldn't get it to focus properly and I was getting really excited about this American engineer who was going to come visit and um, uh, fix this system for me and this sort of man walked in and he asked me in a very Geordie accent not an American accent if there was a sports shop he just literally just looked at the system he didn't even lay hands on it or anything he just said you know is there a sports shop anywhere in the vicinity and you know sort of sent him to the high street and sat there thinking honestly he's gonna go shopping when I need him to fix my system and he came back with a tube of tennis balls and he sat this which was like a giant uh, microscope with this imaging computerized camera system on the top he sat it on these four balls and it just completely stopped the vibration and, and the screen from shaking. And I just thought that this was just like amazing. And he said, we were in a tower of that was 32 feet, two, 32 uh, floors. And the middle section of large buildings vibrates more. It's all to do with the way that they're built to withstand any earthquakes or, or uh, tremors tall blocks are always built so the middle takes the impact and we were sort of around about the middle on the ninth floor so we were taking the impact of this tall building and that that's why there was this vibration that we probably got used to working on the floor 
But because the camera was so sensitive on top of this microscope, it was causing this tremor. And these four tennis balls just took that away. Do you know what? I thought this was just amazing. I, was, I thought it was so amazing. I actually eventually married the man. So that's how I met my husband. He won you over with some tennis balls and a very innovative approach. Sounds, sounds like it sounds like a very good catch. And on the on the topic of of that lovely man that you you met and and, and married since, it'd be really good to hear about how you how you juggled your you know your family life balance. You mentioned your your husband worked at NASA. How, how did you how did you find having a family? I'm aware that you had a few children afterwards. It'd be really good to hear about that balance. Do you um looking back on my career I don't think I ever found it difficult you know with with the with the boys and and and, and Paul traveling a lot and and my career I think I was really lucky I had family both Paul's family and my own family always you know there to you know and very very supportive um I think the boys schools as well um when they were going through schools they were very progressive in that they had uh, after school care they had after school clubs i never felt that i was rushing home and in fact when james was born um james was such a good baby that um i got bored on maternity leave and i remember um Christine Harrison, who who was the you know the head of the department at the time, coming to visit me with gifts from the department about at sort of the end of the second week of my maternity leave, and and I remember saying to her how bored I was, and then on the Monday she came to see me again and she brought me a microscope to the house and some cases to analyse and just said you know you get bored you can always do a bit of analysis to just keep your hand in. And uh, she left me 20 cases and she said, you know, she'd call back on the Friday. And if I hadn't managed to complete them, you know, they weren't urgent. So she could take them back and take them back on the Friday and they would do them the following week. Well, I did actually manage to complete them. And so she said, um, well, as I, you know, was so bored and she'd had a chat with the creche because that it was I was at the Christie Hospital at the time and uh, you know as a deputy and she'd had a chuck the crash and they'd agreed to take James who was only about three weeks old by then in the crash so that I could actually officially go back to work and and that's what I did so from the age of three weeks James went into the Christie crash I mean did it he's done him no harm he's a qualified solicitor now so you know putting him into it no crash, it, it did him absolutely no harm. So I was really lucky that the Christie Hospital had this fantastic crash with neonatal, almost neonatal nurses who were there able to look after and great carers in this crash. And, and James actually stayed there um, till he was two and a half. And then he went to a Montessori school that started at eight, finished at six, which was literally 200 yards from the Christie Hospital. So again, you know, it just made my life and my career a lot easier um so I never really struggled with uh you know bringing up the kids and you know having to work I never felt that I had to rush off uh, you know there were a couple of occasions when um you know James wasn't well um and I had to stay at home with him but you know I just worked from home I just took stuff home to read or you know papers to write and uh, and and just worked around you just got on with it really I think that really highlights as well Angela the importance of having that supportive network at work where people acknowledge mm. that you know that families are important and like you mentioned there about having the crash and the school nearby so having that infrastructure that supports women to go back to work you know if they wish to do so and I, I think that's that's really important when when people are thinking about you know what will suit their needs their families as well and, and their and their careers and, and in terms of your career Angela because we can't cover it all today because you've, you've done so much and you've basically been a tremendous leader in revolutionizing how how we do genomics so every I guess my question to you would be what are the biggest changes you've seen and how did you lead those changes so I suppose I mean, the image analysis was an enormous 
uh, change. And, and I remember um, we introduced image analysis at the Christie Hospital really quickly. I mean, we were a, a relatively small team and it was really easy to, to influence and, 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 and bring that about. Um, and when I moved to um, the, the, the women's hospital, they had sort of introduced image analysis, but sort of one person was doing it. Um, and, and sort of everybody was giving him the slides and um, it wasn't embedded the way that we'd embedded it at the Christie. And so we worked really hard um, to, to sort of win people's hearts and minds to, to, to get it embedded. Um, I think that was quite a struggle because people liked their microscopes. They liked being able to look down their microscopes and see the actual image. And there was a lot of distrust that this camera, you know, wouldn't take photographs that were as um, as good as the image that they were seeing um, down the microscope. And and I remember coming in one weekend because I used to do a, a Saturday on the Saturday rotor and I remember taking away a few of the microscopes and putting them in my office so that when people came in they were almost forced to just use the images and, and what I said was look if you find it really really hard you can have the microscopes back um, but actually by the end of the week they didn't want their microscopes back they found that the microscopes were actually cluttering their desks so you know we, we managed to introduce image analysis. But I found that every time we wanted to introduce something new, um, it was always a challenge. You know, we used to have a whole group of people. There were the early adopters. You know, there were the people who really wanted, you know, bring it on, give us something new, loved it. You know, there were the, there were the people that sort of waited to see what everybody else was doing. And once, it, you know, everybody else had sort of embedded it, they would be like, yeah, OK. And then there were the laggards who were really reluctant, but to, you know, you drag them into changing their thinking about new innovation. And but what it taught me was that you know you're always going to have the people who are the change agents, the early adopters. You know, you've got to work with the willing and you know get them to adopt the things that you want adopted, and then others will come on board you'll get to a point where there's a tipping point where others will say oh yeah let's see what the fuss is about and, and join in and then eventually you know you will always have your laggards who will always not want but reluctantly will, will do it and it's really about that hearts winning, winning hearts and minds it really is and 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 that's how I've always you know, with any change and, and, you know, for me, change is really important because, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm wedded to continuous quality improvements. And, you know, wherever I've I've worked, you know, some people have thought that that was a real challenge, that you constantly want to change things and, and others have, you know, been on board with it. But you really do have to win people's hearts and minds, you know, and I think as scientists, people want to see the evidence first. You know, they want to see all all the the, the data and the statistics and they want to be uh, they want it proven that it actually works before, you know, they'll take it on. And and, and that's and, and I recognize that. And so with every new innovation, you know, you have to recognize that you'll always have the early adopters and you'll always have those that will take a little while to, to come on board and you always need to start with working with the willing. And as you mentioned working with the willing but also building the trust um, mm. and those relationships to kind of bring people along in that vision that you know, you've done so well and I think that's many people on this call would have I, I imagine faced similar challenges of trying to bring in innovations and I think taking those those guidance um, that guidance from you there, I think will, will really help people kind of shape how they how they deliver changes. So thank you very much, Angela. I, I have so many more questions to ask, but I know people have started to ask questions in the chat. I think it's only fair that I'll, I'll pause some of my questions and move a bit to the chat. So that the first question um, is, so thank you, Angela, for your inspiring story. What are you most proud of in your career so far? Well, I'm, I'm definitely proud of my family. I'm proud of 
both my boys they've they've both achieved so much uh, in their you know and and they're both re relatively young i mean jonathan's 40 and two wonderful grandsons and a, a great career he's out in texas now he's working uh for one of those nasa spin-off companies um and 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 doing an incredibly well as a as a, a product specialist and um you know my youngest son who is a solicitor I, I knew he would be something like that because from from a very very young age I you just could not argue with James he had the answer to everything and um well suited to his role so we have counsel upstairs he's now he's now you know he's come back and he's living with us at, at the moment it has been for for the last couple of couple of years and uh you know, he keeps us on the straight and narrow. Um, so I'm really, really proud of my family. And my, you know, my extended family who have always, who have always been there for us, um, or, you know, as, as a family here. Um, but I think for me, it's it, it, winning the, or being honoured with the, with the MBE and being able to share that with the family. You know, um, my, my mother and James, my youngest and, and poor my husband, sat on the front row. Um, and just to see their faces, you know, when I, when I came through and I, I had uh, Prince William um, at the investiture and, and, and he was just so engaging and amazing. And it was a really, really proud moment for me because, you know, there's just a smile on my mother's face. Um, and just knowing that, you know, how, proud that she was of me made me feel uh, really proud so and family is so important to me so the fact that I was able to share that with my family was was, was just amazing I was yeah that was a, a really really proud moment for me that does sound like a wonderful experience and I think we, we can't continue without kind of just briefly mentioning that MB a little bit more for anyone who's not aware um, and I know Sharon uh, briefly introduced at the beginning that Angela was honoured in the Queen's birthday list with an MBE for research and mentoring students. So a, a question to follow on from that, Angela, would be, you know, what advice would you give to other women in STEM who are looking for guidance on how to effectively mentor students and maybe how to look for a mentor and, and what that really helps in the, what the help of the list of that is on their career? Yeah, so I must admit, I have, I've had a mentor um, for many decades now. Um, in fact, I've had the same mentor um, and she was a CEO in our organisation at the Women's. Um, she now is a, a CEO at St Helens and, and Knowsley, um, Anne Ma, uh, and the most, an incredible, incredible woman, um, um, formidable chief executive and very, very well respected. Uh, in, in the NHS and, and very, very well known and respected in the Northwest. And she used to really, really challenge me, really challenge me. And, and I remember um, I once wanted to purchase a sequencer for our genetics department. And I prepared this amazing presentation, blow your mind, you know, with all the facts and figures and the science and and I presented it to the trust board on this day that they were going to be awarding uh, finance for equipment on the same day that a neonatologist presented the need for neonatal cots. And um, I did blow their minds, I blew their minds with the science and what this equipment could do, um, you know, as far as, as far as genetics was concerned. Uh, the neonatologist showed some amazing pictures of the tiniest little babies who desperately needed incubators or they would die. Now, I won the board's minds, but he won their hearts. And it taught me that when I mentor people, you know, I have to tell them that, you know, the science isn't enough. You know, you've also got to learn to tell your story you know, know your audience and, you know, you've, you've, you've got to have a narrative that not just captures people's minds. I mean, the, the science has got to be robust. The evidence has got to be good. But you've also got to be able to tell a story that captures people here, captures their hearts. Otherwise, you know, there's always going to be a neonatologist with a tiny little baby that's going to just capture everybody's heart. So um, yeah, that was, that's something that I always, when I, and that was something that my mentor said to me, you know, good enough is good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect, 
but you've got to know your audience and you've got to capture their hearts. You know, that's the way forward in any situation. You've got to know what is it that they want from you and, you know, always capture their hearts. Well, I can definitely assure you that you've captured my mind and my heart today on the call. I'm sure many other people as well. We've had some wonderful comments coming through to the chat about finding it interesting about those changes that you've delivered and how you've delivered them. And we've got rounds of applause. So really that advice that was given to you by your mentor and hopefully will be given by other people on this call who have become mentors, I think is a wonderful, a wonderful piece of advice. Um, and moving on to more advice, we have some other questions. And I think we, we, we only have about five more minutes of questions before I hand over to Sharon. So uh, please keep them coming in and I'll try to get through them all. The next question is, is, what advice would you give to people early in their careers? And also as a comment, pleasure to, pleasure to meet you and it's fantastic to hear about you. Oh, thank you very much. Early in your careers, what I would say is just read as much as you can. Just, you know, know, know the subject that you're going into, but only go into a career if you're really passionate about it. You know, I was, I was actually, I had a call earlier uh, with a young student who's just finished university, who's thinking about uh, applying for um, the STP programme, the science training programme. And um, in fact, she's, a, she's the daughter of a friend of Anne Ma, who's my mentor. That's how um, I, I was asked if I would just talk to, to her. And I said the same thing to her. You know, you're going to be in a career for a long time. I mean, I've been in genetics for over 40 years. And you're going to spend most of your day in that career. You know, you've at least got to feel moved and passionate about what you're doing otherwise you know you're wasting your time the other thing that I would say to people early on in their careers is make sure that you feel that that career is going to make a difference that you feel it's going to make a difference and it has purpose because if your career doesn't have purpose and it doesn't make a difference you're really going to get fed up with it or bored with it very, very quickly. So think about if you're going into something and it doesn't matter what it is, do you, does it really inspire you? Does it really make you feel excited when you read about it or when you talk about it to others? Do others see that excitement in you when you talk about it? Because if they don't, you may as well be selling shoes at a supermarket or, or whatever or stacking shelves, you know, it, You've got to do something that you feel really has purpose and makes a difference. That makes a difference to you as well as as others. That's what I would um, advise. Thank you, Angela. I, I completely agree, and thank you so much for that advice. I have a few more questions, which I'll try to get through pretty quickly. Um, the next one is: Thank you for being so transparent, Angela, about your support at work and the wider network. What can we do for those who are not so lucky or fortunate? to have that work-life balance and perhaps some solutions to make the most out of family life and career? I think we are really lucky in the NHS. I don't think uh, we realise um, how flexible um, working in the NHS can be. And, and if you find that you're not, you're, you're, the NHS organisation you're working in is not as flexible as it, it can be, then, then let me know and I'll give you some ideas about how you can talk to your HR department. But, but um, I think from, from my perspective, I've always worked in NHS organisations who have had very flexible working arrangements. You know, there are um, term time, you, you know, people can have term time off. You know, we give a whole year for, for maternity leave. We now have paternity leave. Um, you know, we support people who are off uh, through sickness. I think it's really, really important that you know your workforce, you know everybody individually, learn their stories, you know, connect with them on a personal level. Uh, because then you can start to recognise um, when um, things might be not quite right in their home. You know, I I wear my heart on my sleeve. You know, I am, I suppose, what people will describe, you know, what you see is what you get. So this is the authentic me. You know, what I am at work is what I am, full stop, you know. Um, and so when I'm down, people can see that. But not everybody wears their heart on their sleeve and people can hide 
um, their unhappiness or you know their illness they they can hide it and put on a persona at work and as a leader you need to be able to recognize when people are not quite themselves because that's when they really need your support and it's walking the corridors having those simple conversations keeping your door open you know inviting people in being approachable you know these are the things that make your team feel valued and and I I've always known that if I'm valued if I feel that my line manager my boss that you know my heads of department value me then I give more than 100%. I give everything, you know, I will work every hour if I have to, um, because I know I'm valued. And the only way people know that they're valued, if you take time to get to know them, if you take time to talk to them and show them that you appreciate them and you value them. So talk to your team, walk down the corridor, find out how their kids are, you know, find out what makes them passionate and help them. Thank you, Manager. Again, very inspirational words, and I really hope everyone listens to that and, and does exactly what you've said, is and you know, listen to the team and empower people. And unfortunately, we're almost out of time, so I'm gonna to have to give the next question to Rob, Robert, who, who asked first, and then pass it over to Sharon. For everyone else, I'm really sorry we couldn't get to them. So Angie, if you could answer this as quickly as possible, so we can pass it over to Sharon. So the, the last question is, well done, Angela. Rob in Scotland here. Do you have any messages for trainees now who have lived through the pandemic at such a formative time? Do you know what? This has been such an unprecedented time and there is so much to learn from this pandemic. Um, we've done lots of things differently and we've, I know our trainees have been, must, must feel as though they've, they've come into these training roles at times when they've perhaps not had the same sort of training as, as previous trainees you know what i would say to you is 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 em, uh, embrace this unprecedented time because it you know may not happen again and take the beneficial changes that have happened during this time and make sure that they're embedded but also it gives you an opportunity to reflect on you know did the training work for you the way that it was delivered and if not say so so that we don't continue with the things that actually we should be stopping um, because they really don't work um, don't be afraid to have your say and make sure that you're listened to because that's really important too thank, thank you angela and just a massive thank you for me to for you coming today to tell your story and I'm going to pass over to uh, Sharon now to, to close the meeting and to give some final remarks. Well, thank you so much, Angela. I, I think I'm going to be ringing you up on a regular basis for advice because everything you said has been fantastic. I mean, just to draw out a couple of the things I think that that really struck a chord with me. I think you've highlighted the importance uh, to women of childcare, um, often at a very early point in, in, in motherhood and having that throughout life can really help a career. And I, I was struck by the fact that you that your teacher influenced you so much. And I think that having teachers that influence us and inspire us into STEM subjects is also very important. But there were many other things that you said that I think were really powerful. For example, working with the willing when you're thinking about change management, winning over hearts and minds when you want to achieve something. Um, I really like the fact that you said, you know, it's never too late to change your direction. Um, so that's a powerful a statement for all of us. And doing something that you uh, really love to do gets you out of bed in the morning. Uh, but uh, the, the, perhaps the most powerful thing, and uh, particularly during the pandemic, which has been very challenging, is to value others and to respect others and to treat others with the care and attention that we would want ourselves. And so, I mean, you know, from top to bottom, what you've said has been incredibly powerful uh, for me. I hope it's been powerful for other people. Um, I wish you a very, very happy birthday tomorrow. I do oh, hope you. that you're not going to be uh, working tomorrow. I hope that you've got some time yeah. off with, with your family. That's fantastic news. Now, I would, I would encourage, uh, the, as, as we've already said, this is recorded. Uh, the recording will be on the COG UK website and also on the COG UK YouTube channel. And so, you know, do, uh, do go back and have another listen and encourage your colleagues and friends to also uh, have a listen, because I think that there's so much there uh, to listen to and to 
uh, really draw from in our own lives as we as we uh, live our lives with our family and in our careers, etc. So, Angela, a big thank you uh, from all of us, and and um, I hope that we can all stay in touch and continue to learn from your wisdom. Thank you. Oh, definitely. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, and bye bye.